Welcome to Flipping Tables, where we bring all of our religious thinking to Jesus who flips the table for his upside down kingdom. I'm Julie Sexton, and I'll be your host. Welcome to episode 26. I hope by the end of this episode, you are shouting for joy. We're going to cover the healing of a man who is both deaf and mute. And did I mention he's a Gentile? Jesus has made one previous stop in the Decapolis. And while there, he healed a demon-possessed man. And this Bible reading always makes all the bacon lovers shiver over Jesus sending a legion of demons into a herd of pigs. The locals weren't very happy about it either. So they asked Jesus if he could kindly leave their region. Apparently, Jesus was bad for the economy. Nevertheless, after his journey through Tyre and Sidon, he came way out of his way, possibly up to 120 miles, which kind of makes me wonder which one of the disciples was in charge of the GPS. So on our journey through Mark, we had to make this stop because this healing didn't make it into any of the other gospels. We don't know why that is, but it is way too special for us not to slow down and behold the healing and restoration that is in Christ alone. If you're home and you have a cake, grab a slice. Because listen, friends, it's always a good time for cake. Welcome to our table. Kimberly and Twyla are both with us for this episode. And I just have to say, Kimberly, since I brought up cake, mm-hmm. can we talk about the cake situation at your house? There because- are cakes everywhere. Every time I get on social media, I feel like you or Twyla is one posting a picture of a cake. And you posted a picture the other day of the s'mores cake. And what did you say you called it? This is the cake of the summer. Summer 2023. Have you made this cake a few times? I have made this cake a few times because it's been a big hit. And lots of people have been having babies and surgeries, so it's been... Do they get a s'mores cake every time? They get a s'mores cake. Okay, I don't want to have a baby, but actually I don't want to have surgery either. (laughs) What do I have to do to get one of these cakes? A a major milestone. (laughs) A major milestone. (laughs) Or if you just ask, I might make it sometime. I did make it for my life group, and that's not a major milestone. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we've just... um, I say we... I do most of the work, but the boys like to come and help. And by help, I mean, like, test the frosting and things, lick the batters, which is what I did as a kid, so I don't mind it. Um, But, yeah, we've just really enjoyed baking a lot of cakes this summer. So there's that. And they're so pretty that I have to post pictures. Yeah, they are pretty. They're beautiful. And you, you made a cake this week, I think. You know I live for a good cake. Yeah, Jalen just had his 23rd birthday, and so I asked him what special requests he had, and he said, I don't care what kind of cake you make, just so long as it has your signature buttercream icing. So I made him a lemon cake, and it was pretty fabulous. It was pretty fabulous. You're quite famous for your buttercream. I really am, I'm just going to say. <laughs> Sometimes it's I worth think- the hype. She posts so many cakes. I think maybe she's actually, that's what arm confetti is more about cake. (laughs) I don't think she's making bracelets anymore. I think she's like selling buttercream on the down low or something. (laughs) Well, you know, I've set this precedent with all these big kids that come over, right? With my big kids and then their friends that come with that. Like, if you have a birthday, I make you a cake. If they, so Avery and Bella have um, friends that are married that have little bitty kids. When it was Judah's birthday, I made Judah's birthday cake. And, in fact, his little baby sister just had her first birthday. And he said, did Miss Twyla make the cake? And they said, no. And he said, Miss Twyla made my construction cake. So I'm kind of famous for the cakes. I think you you are. I think you are. And you should be because they are delicious. Her cakes are always delicious. Thank you, ladies. I mean, I had an itch the other day to bake. You know, sometimes you wake up and you just, like, want cake. Yeah. <laughs> every day. It doesn't. I mean, well, this doesn't happen every day, but I really, the Good other for day, you. I, <laughs> I really wanted to bake some kind of like fruity coffee cake or something. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, but I was strong. 
So I toasted a piece of sourdough and I made some avocado toast with an, <laughs> I dressed it up. I went all out. I did a poached egg. I had some arugula and I was just getting this beautiful breakfast plated and Paul was upstairs in his office and he calls and he says, hey, Julie, can you come upstairs? And I was like, okay, well, hold on just a minute. And I go upstairs and he wants to like talk finances. He wants to have like a conversation about the Flourish Ministries finances and writing checks and stuff. And I was like, I hate numbers. <laughs> and I'm standing there holding my beautiful breakfast and he wants to have this conversation. And I'm like, listen, man, I got up early to spend time with Jesus, to go on a walk, and I'm having my breakfast now. And you brought me up here to talk about numbers, which is one of my least favorite things to do in the entire world. And you're ruining my breakfast. <laughs> Poor Polly had no idea. <laughs> and I thought, I have already like faced down a demon, like resisting baking <laughs> cake. And, and now I wish I had cake because now I'm stressed because <laughs> numbers stress me. Even if there's no reason to be stressed, I just don't like talking about numbers. <laughs> oh, Paul. I know it was bad. It was bad, bad. I should have taken you out after for cake. <laughs> no, he made a joke because uh, I said something about, you know, I was talking about how I didn't get up early for this. Um, he said, I think you were like in training so you could go rounds with me. <laughs> he just made a big <laughs> joke about it. It was kind of funny. All right. So let's talk about Mark. This is a unique healing because it's only in this gospel, like I mentioned in the opening. But um, Trila, do you want to read Mark 7, verses 31 through 37? Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to the heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. Okay, so let's start with a couple of questions. Why does Mark include this healing when none of the other Gospels writers writers do? And why did they take this 120-mile journey? Like, what was going on? These are some questions that I have, and we're not going to be able to come up with definitive answers, and that's okay. A good student asks questions. It's the disciples who ask questions of the rabbis that make the best students. And so here's another question. Was the man born deaf? Verse 32 says the man was deaf and could hardly speak. But if he had been born deaf without speech therapy, he probably wouldn't have been able to speak at all. So we can't be sure, but it seems likely that maybe he wasn't born deaf. And what I've discovered in my studies is that the Greek word used here for could hardly speak is used only two places in the Bible. This is going to be really important. This definitely is going to require us to dig a little deeper. And we're going to have to go outside of Mark to get into this because we're going to go all the way back to Isaiah 35. And this is in the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation. So that's where we get this second use of this Greek word. And Trila, do you want to say the word? You love to say Greek words. Mogilalos. So this, (laughs) that's pretty good, I think. Not speaking Greek myself. (laughs) But... um, This Greek word is used for this speech impediment. And so I want to go to Isaiah 35. First of all, if you guys know me, you know I love Isaiah. And Isaiah 35 is gold. It's an incredible chapter. I think it's like 10 verses. But this chapter paints a divine picture of restoration that comes after 
Desolation. And Isaiah 35 is a poem. If you're if you have a Bible and you look at it, you'll see it's in like these quotations and it's written out as a poem. But um, that's another reason I love Isaiah is because he is a masterful writer. Like his works are beautiful. But this poem is screaming, Behold God. These are the verses that specifically point to the messianic work, these verses that we're going to read right now. Um, Kimberly, do you want to read verses 5 and 6 out of Isaiah 35? Mm -hmm. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Those are very poetic and beautiful words. I was so excited for you to read those verses because they're so beautiful. And this whole chapter is beautiful. And we're actually going to read the whole chapter in a minute. But I just wanted to skip straight to the to the heart of this lesson where these verses have that connection mm-hmm. that the mute tongue shouting for joy and That's what is going to happen in this healing that Jesus is going to do. So, but for the context in Isaiah, before we get to Isaiah 35, there's these chapters that are pictures of desolation and judgment and destruction for this region of the world and these nations that are surrounding Israel. I uh, was looking at this in my Bible and I have like a note in my Bible in chapter 34. And it's probably something that I picked up maybe from the Bible recap. But I had written in the margin about chapter 34, one of these dark desolation pictures. I was like, this is a picture of the undoing of creation because it's so graphic in this picture of judgment. Um, But as God usually does, that when God gives such graphic pictures of judgment, in His goodness, He often gives a picture of hope as well. And that's what chapter 35 is. It is a picture of hope and restoration. So let's read a little bit. Actually, you know what? Let's just read all of Isaiah 35. It's just too good not to read. And I think It will help us to see the beauty of Jesus traveling to this Gentile and doing a messianic healing in their midst. So, Kimberly, I would love for you now. I know you read five and six, but let's read the whole chapter. Isaiah 35. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution, He will come to save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, and thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there, and those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Wow, I just caught something new there when you were reading it this time. Um, I just caught that sighing will flee away. Mm. That's going to be something to hold on to when we get to the end of our lesson today. Um, As many times as I've read that in preparation, I, I missed it before. 
this is, again, it's beautiful. And what I can say is some of this is happening, like currently, because those first verses in Isaiah 35, that talks about the desert um, will be blooming. That is what is happening in Israel now, like in the desert places. There are it's it's coming to life right before um, our eyes when you're there. It's amazing. What can we take away from Isaiah 35? We can hold on to this truth, that those who trust in the Lord will find themselves on a highway leading home through a transformed desert. God is reminding us that we were made for a garden. This poem might describe the return from exile or the millennial kingdom, or the new heaven and earth, or it might be describing all of these things. But that's not its main purpose. Its main purpose is to highlight the blessed results of trust. When I read this chapter, I am strengthened because I know my God will come. He will make things right. And for right now, Knowing that Jesus traveled a long way to heal a man, I see the spirit of restoration. He healed him. So not only could he hear the word of the Lord, but he would also be able to proclaim the word of the Lord. You know, this man provides us with a before picture of a sinner. We're like death. To the voice of God, so we would be unable to speak to others about God. Before we're in Christ, this is our situation. Afterwards, though, we are sent out with good news to share. So let's walk through some of the specifics about this healing, because it's kind of strange. Mm-hmm. Jesus puts his fingers in the man's ears. And Jesus also spit and touched the man's tongue. So I have lots of questions about this. I mean, what is going on in this scene? Why does Jesus do this? But I can tell you one thing. Jesus is breaking all the Jewish purification laws. He has touched a Gentile. And all Gentiles were unclean. He has put his fingers in this man's ears. Jesus has probably spit in his hand and then touched the man's tongue with his spit. And there's a lot of like speculation about this because there were some in the first century. uh, People believed that spit had Um, these medicinal properties. And that seems out of character. Like that doesn't seem like something that Jesus would be, Mm -hmm. you know, doing because, because like people think spit is magical. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that's what Jesus is doing. No, I don't think so either. (laughs) He's in a Gentile area. So Jesus is possibly meeting them in you know, their cultural context. I I read several things that were like, you know, their speculation about some things that might have been, you know, possibilities to why he's doing this. But one of the things, um, and it was when, you know, Kimberly was reading and she mentioned that um, sigh at the end of Isaiah 35. But when Jesus goes to heal him, he looks to heaven and there's this deep sigh. And I think Jesus is expressing his grief over the man's suffering. And that is really beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's very heartwarming, too, because I know we went back to Isaiah 35 to, you know, look at another place that this Greek word for speech impediment was used. But we got like a bonus. Mm -hmm. We saw something else. And then we get reminded that we were made for Eden, that there are beautiful and wonderful things on our horizon. He's kind of going through some sign language when you think about it with touching his ears and 
touching his tongue and he's kind of like Mm -hmm. walking him through so if you're visual and i'm i'm a visual learner so i picture jesus standing before and doing these things and he's kind of communicating to this man because in a way that people have been communicating with him they've Mm -hmm. probably been gesturing and and doing things normally when jesus does a healing in a gentile area he doesn't tell them to keep it a secret but he does this time and they didn't listen, which every time they tell he tells someone not to, you know, to keep it on the down low, mm-hmm. they always go against his wishes. But I really don't understand that. It does perplex me a little bit. I don't know why um, in this healing, and we can't turn to the other Gospels because, again, this is only used in, um, in Mark's Gospel, but... He usually, again, if it's a Gentile area, he doesn't put those um, restrictions on them because he wants the gospel um, to spread in those areas. So I don't know what is what is going on with that, but the people didn't listen. And I will say that I do love what the people said at the end. And again, Mark uses... Um, the word amazement because what Jesus does is amazing Mm -hmm. but the people said he has done everything well and you know that is that's crazy because we can say that like reading the gospels and and looking back and we were like everything that Jesus does is amazing but this is possibly their only encounter with Jesus and they saw this one thing and they were like wow everything that he does is amazing it's or i'm sorry they said i'm i'm kind of jumbling it up a little bit but they said he has done everything well and the reason i think that that stood out to me is because we're talking about restoration that's one of the amazing things that um comes across in with us going back to isaiah 35 but when we're talking about restoration This um, phrase harkens back to Genesis. When after creation is complete, it says that God saw that it was good. And that just kind of triggered in me when I read that the people said, he has done everything well. Because it took me back in my thoughts and mind back to creation. Mm -hmm. And... When everything was good and well and nobody would have been deaf or mute or any of the other consequences of living in a fallen world. Mm -hmm. And I just think Jesus is giving us a preview, which is all of his ministry is like a preview of better things to come. Jesus's restoration of this man is just the beginning of the new creation Man will be restored to the perfect image of God. Everything that was lost, everything that has come into our lives because we live in a world with sin and the consequences, one day we won't have that and everything will be restored. I there's a there's a poem, I guess because we've been talking about poems in Isaiah, but there's a poem that I read, I think it was in a John Eldridge book a long time ago that I read. But there is and I don't I think it was Yeats who wrote it, but it was a called Before the World Began. Mm-hmm. And in that poem there was a line that said that something like, I go from mirror to mirror because I'm looking for the face that I had before the world began. And it's just like there's something within us that we know that this is a broken image. Mm-hmm. We're we're longing for that restoration. Yeah, yeah. It kind of reminds me of um, uh, one of my sons has a really hard time sleeping at night. It's like all of anything in the back of his mind just comes to the forefront when it's time to sleep. And so a lot of times, um, 
when I'm praying over him at night, I just talk about like, God, we're looking forward to, you know, just, and I just describe all the things that I read in the Bible of just beautiful gardens and the river of life and the trees with fruits that heal the nation and just try to describe this beautiful picture for him to to think about before he goes to bed and just like we have so much good to look forward to yeah yeah i mean you're referencing chapters at the end of revelation that is the restoration Mm -hmm. that's when all things are made right Mm -hmm. and we're back in the garden because we were made to live in a garden Mm -hmm. and when you're talking about that it also makes me think about one of my daughters when she was you know in her adolescent years probably a little younger than your boys she would have trouble sleeping and she would have nightmares and when i would come and you know sit with her in the night the thing that she would want me to do is she would say mom sing sing the song that the angels never stop singing around god's throne and she was asking me to sing holy 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 and that brought her such comfort because like we live in this fallen world but we know that god reigns and in his throne room he is forever worshiped and forever praised and it's perfect and beautiful and we're just trying to get to that place Mm -hmm. and it would bring her comfort and it would bring me comfort and it's something that i've done at different seasons of my life if i've had a hard season but i really think she taught me that because i think it was a song um we didn't go to a church that sang a lot of hymns but i think she learned it probably at bsf and i think because it was something that had brought me comfort maybe she had heard me singing it as well Mm -hmm. but it's because we're craving the restoration yeah absolutely so well i love this um, conversation i loved the lesson um about you know getting to go back to isaiah and just reading that and i pray that for our listeners that that just washes over you with hope and this isn't all there is if you're in christ you have better things ahead of you Um, that's what c.s lewis it's one of my favorite quotes it's on the front of my car and it just says there are far far better things ahead than any we leave behind just as kind of one of those grounding truths Mm -hmm. and i love that at the end of the journey jesus um before he went back across the sea of galilee into um, his home region he made this stop so before we wrap up um i want to say that twyla had to scoot out in the in before we finished recording this episode but she had a good reason so i'm going to share her bright spot Mm -hmm. but her bright spot is her son is um singing um and that's where she had to go pick him up. He's going to be opening, I think, the opening act for The Sound of Music. Do you love The Sound of Music? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's going to be performed locally. And he's a part of the the pre, um, I don't know, what am I trying to say? The, the pre-show? The pre-show, yeah. It's like a hype man. <laughs> yes, actually. And he is a fantastic singer. Oh, he's amazing. I saw a video she posted today, and I was like, that boy has a set of pipes. He <laughs> does. He's amazing. So she said that that was going to be her bright spot because she got to watch that last night. And Aww. so do you have a bright spot? Yeah. Um, so I signed up Elliot and Luke for swim lessons. And I was dreading taking Clark to the pool because, you know, <laughs> now that the big boys are big enough to get in, like, by themselves, and I didn't have to get in with them, and I'm starting all over. Um, and I was just having to carry him around because he was kind of afraid of the water. Well, yesterday, I, I don't know, he put on his little life jacket, 
which he refused to put on earlier. And I think that's part of why he was a little scared. He turned into a little fish. Oh, really? Yeah, we had the best time. He was like, Mom, look. Mom, look. And, you know, he was just floating. <laughs> just floating. <laughs> yeah. But he had, he had such a good time. And I was like, oh, coming to the Y can be fun again. <laughs> good. So it was just, it was sweet to see him have so much fun. And it helped me to have more fun, too. <laughs> yeah, I miss those pool days. I loved that with my kids. That was, that was good times. I did appreciate when they were old enough that they were doing their own thing and I could sit and read or, or yes. something. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> but um, every time one of them tells me that they're going to the, going to the pool, um, I'm always like, oh, that's sad. Right. <laughs> Do you want me to come with you? <laughs> Do you want me to come with you? <laughs> I did actually offer that a couple of weeks ago to Lydia. She was, she was at her boss's pool and she said, you know, I'm, I'm just tanning. And I was like, do you need some company? <laughs> you look tan. Have you gone with her a couple times? I haven't. I think it's from walking. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. I have that sock tan line. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's not pretty. No. I do. <laughs> but um, let's see. What is my bright spot? Um, okay. My bright spot is very simple. And again, I think I, I said flowers in May because remember I got the lecture on how to, that I was saying the word wrong. But <laughs> Penny. The, yeah, there she goes. She's over there saying it. Snickering. Uh, yeah. But um, my July garden has been amazing. I've had so many beautiful flowers in full bloom, and I have been really just enjoying that. Um, I just looked over at my desk, and I have some zinnias from my garden, and it'll be like that for the rest of the summer. I'll have flowers, and again... You do have a beautiful garden. But I think... Which ties into our episode. It totally ties into the episode, because that's, you know... I was made to live in a garden. You sure were. And we all were. So friends, wherever you're at, I hope that there is some beautiful flowers and some beautiful singing and praise and just things that you can enjoy. This is not all that there is. There are so many wonderful things ahead of us. So keep following the table flipper and leave the table flipping to Jesus. Jesus.